Welcome to Renegade Inc. and welcome to diet season. The idea at the heart of every diet is that if you're fat, it's solely your fault. But what if that simply isn't true? Yes, sedentary lives have expanded our waistlines, but so too have the multi-billions of dollars that the food industry pump into feeding us lies year after year. Here I come, here I come. Burger King chicken fries are now a buck sixty-nine. New Weetabix chocolate spoon size. Two sausage patties and two slices of cheese. It can be found in my Reese's Buffs. Kellogg's Crunchy Nut, deliciously nutty flakes. Go Pizza Hut now. Get two or more of your favorites from the Five and Up lineup. We're always working on our Happy Meal to make it even happier. <laughs> Lucky Charm cereal, part of a good breakfast. The vicious circle is pernicious. Food scientists engineer craveable products that have bliss points. Consumers lose control of their eating habits and then their willpower. Self-blame kicks in and then self-esteem plummets, which means to temporarily escape those understandable negative feelings, consumers find themselves back at the food store. Michael, it seems to me that when we talk about food, we often talk about the food industry, the food business. And in a sense, that's almost where we've lost the battle. Because as soon as you start talking about business, like agribusiness, um, we're talking implicitly about profits. And when you think about that business sell, you can't have a massive profit and very good ingredients. So something has to give. Is that really the dichotomy between eating well uh, and a lot of the junk food that's pumped into the world? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think that sort of after World War II, most of us still ate whole foods, grains and vegetables and meats. And then we gradually allowed this industry to tell us what to eat and to form and control our eating habits. I mean, it's even worse than that. We turned food over to them, allowing them to define it in a way that ultimately was not very good for us. I mean, I like to think that the food industry is not this evil giant that sort of intentionally set out to make us usually overweight or over dependent on their products. I mean, by and large, they were responding to these big societal changes that were happening. And after World War II, one of the things you found is that more and more women were getting jobs outside of the house. And that caused us to be time hungry. We wanted products that would save us time and allow us not to have to rush home and spend hours in the kitchen doing dinner. So as an industry, they exploited our desire for convenience. Yeah, the food companies are incredibly good at sort of tapping into those biological instincts we have for cheapness. We love our food as inexpensive as we can possibly get it. We love our food to be convenient and easy as a, as a time saver. And then of course we love the flavors that they're able to emit. And they're, they're really brilliant at tapping into and exploiting those, those biological loves that we have. I mean, I was lucky to meet one of the icons in the industry. His name was Howard Moskowitz. He was trained in high math and then experimental psychology at Harvard University. He's responsible for many of the biggest sort of brand products in the grocery store. And he walked me through his recent creation of a new flavor of soda for the American company, Dr. Pepper, right. where he started with no less than 60 versions of sweetness, submitted those to three or 4,000 consumer taste testings around the country, and then took the data and put it in his computer. And he did his high math regression analysis thing, and out comes these bell-shaped curves where at the top of the curve is the perfect amount of sweetness that would send the most people over the moon and their products flying off the shelf. It was Howard who coined the term the bliss point to right. describe our innate biological attraction to sugar. But here's where it gets really interesting, which is when you talk to nutritionists, the problem isn't that the companies have consultants like Howard working for them, engineering bliss points for things that we know should be sweet. They marched around the grocery store adding sugar to things that didn't used to be sweet anymore, creating a bliss point. So now that some yogurt can have as much sugar in it per serving as ice cream, bread has added sugar in it to create this bliss point for sugar. Pasta sauce can have the equivalent of a couple of Oreo cookies with a sugar in a tiny half cup serving. 
And what this did was create in us this expectancy that everything should be sweet. Right. And so when you drag yourself over to the vegetable aisle and try to eat those things that have other tastes, like bitter or sour, you know, you're gonna have a rebellion on your hands if, if you have kids. The uh, interesting thing about Howard, when asked, he said um, that he doesn't drink soda because, <laughs> quote, it's bad for your teeth. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> that's, that's quite an out, isn't it? That and that's quite dark. The, that was one of the huge surprising things for me. Well, two surprising things from my research and reporting is one, the executives of these companies don't eat their own products. They, they don't try they, their own supply. They know better in terms of how powerful that supply is. And then two, those companies are even more hooked on using, in this case, gobs of salt sugar fat than we are independent on those. Why? Because it's money to them, it's profitability. I mean, there's this formula in the industry called the least cost formulation. Again, knowing that we like our food as inexpensive as we can possibly get it. They are constantly redesigning their products to make the cost less so they can lower the price. Sugar, salt, fat are by and large quite inexpensive as additives to, to food. And that's one of the reasons they're so dependent on this. But now we're back to the business end, right? Because ultimately you're looking for margin, you're looking to pad products out, you want economies of scale. <laughs> At what cost? That's the cost of the convenience, the low price. The cost has been to our health. I mean, the right. numbers are staggering. And what are the numbers? Walk In this them. country, 40% now of American adults are obese, defined as not just overweight, 35 pounds of overweight or more. Another third of the country is overweight, right. approaching obesity. And that's just, that's just sort of one crude measure of us losing control of our food. There's diabetes, there's gout. There are all sorts of other sort of health issues, along with just kind of discomfort and agony of having lost touch with something that we used to love. Mm -hmm. Cooking food was family, it was warmth, it's our history, it's our culture, it's warmth that we've sold off to the companies in exchange for, for what we thought was a better deal, convenience and cheapness. Was the television part of this? You know, was it actually the TV dinner that started, or the TV meal that started, <laughs> yeah, ironically? You know, yeah, as a kid, we grew up on TV. We had little trays and with our TV dinners that we got from the Frozen section and watched TV together. That contributed to what's called kind of the mindlessness of eating, where we allowed ourselves to be distracted by other things to the extent that we lost touch with the food. And then the other phenomena that happened too is that we started snacking. And in this country it happened it's seemingly almost overnight where parents stopped telling their kids not to spoil their appetite for meals. It became socially acceptable to eat anything, anywhere, anytime. Snacks became the fourth meal we're now getting on average 580 calories a day from snacking on average three times a day. And so that sped up kind of the process of eating and diminished the importance of the family meal uh, even further. My name is Tam Fry. I am the chair of the UK National Obesity Forum. Hidden sugar is a real problem. Uh, the packaging of uh, food products is so bad in this country that uh, manufacturers can put in sugar to great volume without the customer actually being aware that the sugar's there. Another form of hidden sugar is that sugar is put in things that you least expect to find sugar. I'm particularly concerned about the way in which the sugar industry has behaved in relation to uh, how much it puts in its products. Uh, that is, in my view, unforgivable and corporately irresponsible. I am very concerned about the way in which the sugar industry has influenced research, which influences people and the choices that they make. It is now well documented that sugar companies get together and provide researchers with the money which they want in order to do their work. And unfortunately, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And so researchers know very much that they need to modify or even just uh, ignore some of their research findings because it doesn't suit the industry that is paying their work. They use 
all kinds of descriptions of sugar. Particularly disastrous is any word which has got the words O-S-E at the end. Glucose, lactose, fructose, the, the plethora of them. And they use those words correctly, but in a form which disguises the fact that their products are laden with this food, and of course the consumer is then not aware of it. When you look at a product and you look at the traffic light labels, you do not know, unless you have been told to look for it, that the percentages and the levels are all based on an adult female's daily requirement. And uh, with children, that is usually probably two or three times as much as that particular child should be having. And that is the disaster, particularly, should we say, with breakfast cereals, where breakfast cereals are laden with sugar and the children love it. Particularly, of course, then, that affects the poorer families. Poorer families who, with less disposable income, have a higher percentage of sugar in their children's diet than anyone would wish. One of the things which really concerns me and should concern the country is the way in which the sugar industry has uh, put its material in baby foods. Baby foods are now so sugary. And the reason that they do that is because they want to hook the children on sugar, make it addictive so that sugar remains with them for the rest of their lives. Thereby, they will have a absolutely assured market. All that backdrop, all that historical context, the food executives must know like our friend Howard with his Dr Pepper. They must know that that's what's going on in society. And most meetings, if not all, when you're selling product, must be geared towards how do we exploit that socio-economic environment. Yeah, I spent time with the former president of Coca-Cola, the soda giant, and he sort of explained to me that when you're in the mindset of this industry that's fiercely competitive with one another, all of your energy at work and at home when you're thinking about work is focused on beating the competition. And so you just kind of cut out all those kind of nagging questions in the back of your head about, about whether what you're doing is good for, you know, for, for anybody. And you're totally focused on winning the game. Right. That's how they get through the day. And in a sense, that's how people go and win or lose wars. Well, exactly. This sort of blind rush toward where winning is everything. It's the same thing. Uh, and the point on that is a lot of uh, when you do research around war, people don't want to kill other human beings. So you have to move the language. Mm. Uh, so you have to call other human beings targets. You know, you have to desensitize an army yeah. to what they're doing. Yeah. Have the workforce uh, within these food giants been desensitized to the social effects of uh, what they're pushing into the world? What oh, absolutely. And you can see it in the language. I mean, look, I'm an investigative journalist. I follow the money. but. I really fell in love with the language that they use when they're describing their efforts to maximize the allure of their products, which is what their job is all about. I mean, they hate the word addiction, right? But, <laughs> so instead they use things like snackability Ugh. and craveability. And one of my favorite words that they use is more-ishness. More-ishness. Yeah, because everything about them, all of their work is aimed at getting us to not just like their products, but to want more and more of them. So more-ishness fits right into their mode. Um, drug dealers <laughs> are. <laughs> Cocaine's more-ish. Yeah. Heroin's more-ish. I mean, it's the same setup, is it not? Was that too dramatic? No, I mean, look, there is some credibility to give to sort of people who argue that, look, there are some foods out there for some people that are every bit as compelling and causing them to act compulsively as certainly tobacco and alcohol and maybe even sort of some drugs. They're that powerful for some people. It's that hard for them to resist. When we talk about this, you can't help but think that those levels of addiction ultimately are born out of an isolation. Hmm. So if we don't have the nuclear family anymore, the 2.4 kids, the, the, the cooking and you know, the exchange of ideas that we talked about, you do have screens, many screens, whether it be television or, or scrolling, and then you're still snacking and eating. There is a huge isolation to that, yeah. is there not? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. For, for the book I'm working on now, I met a teenager who had sued McDonald's for making her fat. This was some years ago and the, the lawsuit didn't, didn't go anywhere. 
But it was so interesting talk and compelling sort of talking to her and listen to her talk about just that point. I mean, her view of people, so many people who eat at McDonald's is that they're sad. They're home watching TV. They see the advertisement. They feel the joy of that advertisement and they go by themselves to McDonald's or another fast food restaurant and they eat trying to fill that empty hole in themselves. And I thought that was so insightful on her part. The food is isolated. I mean, they took yogurt, for example, put it in a plastic tube that you didn't need a spoon to eat. You would just take that tube and cut it open and squeeze it into your mouth while you're on the joystick playing a computer game, probably with a computer and not even another person on the other end. So by design, their products are made to work for us in, in isolation. And ultimately work for them in stock markets. There you go. In that first half, what we talk about is a huge industry, which is incredibly pernicious, is after one thing, which is shareholder value and executive pay. And it's preying on people who are isolated, maybe um, not as educated as they could be about these things, uh, and also poor. Mm -hmm. When you think about that, really, this, they're waging a war in many ways against people who can't help themselves eat these products. No, it is a war, um, and it's a war that they're waging really skillfully. Um, and so many people have lost control of their eating. We have this disordered eating now in, in the world as a result of that. I met people who can't touch a grain of sugar without losing control of their of their eating, and they go overboard and just can't stop, you know, feeding themselves sugar. Or it might be white refined flour. People have different triggers for different things. But the bottom line is that so many of us are are, are so vulnerable to their advertising and their form. And, and, the, and the marketing of their products and the attractiveness of those products. And um, th at that point, what do they do? Because ultimately, it seems to me that the, the whole system is geared towards pushing more product towards those people. Now, that happens also, by the way, in the gambling industry. It happens you know, across the board, actually, yeah. because yeah. marketeers and their clients, the, the big companies, exploit that vulnerability. I think the first thing that people do is they look for a silver bullet. They look for one thing that can save them, because it's like kind of the easiest way to go, right? So. Typically what we've had is people who will turn to a diet. Right. If weight is their problem, they will find some solution like that to help them lose weight. And the problem is that all diets work until they stop working and almost all diets stop working because they're really difficult to, to stick to. Right, so people have bounced from one industry. Oh into the diet the industry. The diet industry is huge. And then they fail in the diet industry because it's super difficult to change habits. Then they hit the self-blame button yep. and they're back into the food industry. Yep. Because Vicious. that gives them comfort and they say, actually, this is me. And then they carry on. And then they're into the health industry because ultimately, I mean, it's a terrible Vicious matrix. cycle, not kind of realizing that you're not the problem, the companies are the problem. And sort of keeping your focus on that on the companies, on the tricks that they use to keep us dependent, I think is a really helpful way of looking at it going forward and really empowering. Because suddenly you're taking back control and actually you're not saying it's me, you're saying it's you yeah, and I mean, you, need to, you need to get out of my life. I can walk into the grocery store now and just kind of laugh right. at all of the things that the food industry does to get us to reach for that product and put it in the right. grocery cart. I mean, tell the us, tell us well, then. Through, so so when about, you walk in, what do you see? It's all about real estate, right? Um, first, you get the soft music playing in the background <laughs> to sort of like loosen you up a little bit, yeah. right? They also want you to lose the sense of yourself. So they don't want you to connect the decisions you're about to make with the rest of the world out there. So you're kind of in this la la land atmosphere. They have incredibly bright colors which science shows we're attracted to. They control the positioning of their products so that the things called the end caps, which is the end of the aisle facing the aisle where most people walk down, actually you have to buy that space to put your products on there. We'll see that and get attracted to those products. They know, for example, from doing tests that when we walk into an aisle, our attention, they put devices on people's heads that follow their eye movements as they shop. And they know that our attention will go to the center of the aisle at eye level. And so that's where they will put the biggest selling products, the most attractive products. 
in the cereal aisle if you want something without sugar it's going to be down at the ground because the eye level is by level exactly. and this is the <laughs> i mean <laughs> this is the one. rhetoric right or up high where your kids can't but they reach say them. these things these people and then on the packages right they control the front of the package almost entirely which is where they're putting their best foot forward again in breakfast cereals it's going to be a cartoon character to catch the attention of your kid or if you're interested in like nutrition they're going to put in big letters added calcium something nice to say about their products that will distract you from the fine print on the package there's a wonderful anecdote in london where a bunch of mbas business school types were taken by a, one of food industry execs into uh, the supermarket and they said bring back the most brilliant bit of packaging that you can yeah. and we'll judge you on it yeah because packaging's huge right? yeah and the one particularly arty type uh, in the whole group of 16 just brought back a single egg and this executive, because it's beautifully packaged, right? um, and this executive was suitably offended by this because everyone else had brought all this glitzy stuff. So I would have brought back something else. What? I would have brought back a package that has five or six servings of cookies in it because it's so ingenious on their part knowing that. So let's say we are worried about the calories or the other sort of bad additives in there. We turn to the fine print on the back. It'll give us the numbers, but it's per serving if you pay attention to that right. and they do that knowing that most people will not just eat one serving of the package they'll eat half of it or even or even the whole package so designing their package is again not to get us to not just like the product but to want and to eat more and more of it is what defines the processed food industry in, in my mind one of the um, defences that they use that I see regularly is this idea in the UK of the nanny state. Mm -hmm. So we don't want the state telling us what we can and can't do because you, the consumer, can make your own choices yeah. regardless of your addictions and your isolation you do, because ultimately they can sell more product. Yeah. Do they use that uh, across the world as an excuse? To yeah, one of the pushbacks that they're getting are people designing taxes on soda, implementing taxes on soda, when you buy soda, you pay a little bit of a tax as a way of discouraging you from drinking that soda. A sugar and tax. Exactly. And that was, that's exactly how the industry sort of fought back on that, calling that a nanny tax, um, accusing the government of stepping in and blaming you uh, for, for or, or rather blaming them for their problem. And I think that's attractive in some, I mean, nobody wants the, especially in this day and age, the government telling you what to do. So I think that works for the industry. Just for context, um, that light that just went off, that was another, that was a kitten. Yeah, I saw it out of my eye. So what can people do? Because what we've fleshed out is a really pernicious industry that's got billions of dollars of marketing spend behind it. Ultimately, as you said, they're business people. And actually, if there is a social cost, then well, I don't do morality. How can people start to insulate themselves and defend against such a massive machine, really? So on a big level, it's already starting to happen. People are caring more about what they put in their bodies, paying attention to what they're eating, and they've stopped buying, to some extent, some of the junkiest products in the grocery store. And just that little bit of dip in sales is convincing the companies that they're going to have to start doing better by consumers. So there's an immediate sort of reaction to that going on already. And to some extent, that'll work or it won't work, depending on whether we can sort of maintain our interest and focus on eating better. I mean, if you're an individual, you're up against kind of a lifetime of bad habits. Mm. That's incredibly hard to break in a matter of days, weeks, or even months, right? I like the idea of changing just one thing for starters. And one of the food executives I interviewed who ran into trouble eating some of his own products when he couldn't run anymore for exercise, that's what he decided to do. He, started to, he decided to stop drinking anything that had calories in it. Thinking, well, if I can just stop all the liquid calories, you know, that's, that's one thing I can feel good about. It'll go far toward reducing my overall calorie intake. Um, so I think that picking just one thing and changing that and trying to stick with that for a while is maybe a really good strategy. That's a start. It's do you a think? start. Because do a lot of people go cold turkey and say, do you know what, I'm going to quit all this. I'm going to go clean eating. Because yeah. that was a big fad, right? right. A clean eating fad. Right. And that's the extreme diet. Too. Right, so Again, it's one to the other. It'll work until it doesn't work. It's really hard to sustain that. But to change one thing is easier and more sustainable, especially when we get distracted by life, which we will inevitably. It seems to me, though, that's a physical action and something that's concrete that you can do. But 
is that not the second step? Because is the first step removing self-blame from this? Because what actually you're saying is I'm being preyed upon, whether it's through the television, the internet, or my device, uh, on a daily basis, and I'm giving in to that yeah. predation. Yeah, no, I totally love that. And, and again, that's sort of the research I've done in this area for me has been really empowering because it gave me insight into everything they do to get us off our game. Right. And sort of knowing right. that, you don't even have to blame them, but just kind of knowing that they have the power and they have the control and that when I lose control, it's not my fault, it's their doing. I think that in and of itself levels the playing field tremendously for us. So first thing, take self-blame out because actually there's a war out there. I love that. Uh, second thing, take one thing out, yep. incremental change. Keep it easy on yourself. Third thing? Start cooking. That thing we lost, right? The, the thing we turned over to the food companies back after World War II. And it's going to be easier than you think. I started doing that. I started to make my own spaghetti sauce and it's so incredibly easy. Right. It's cheaper too, by the way. And doesn't have nine cups of sugar in it. <laughs> that, that, that as well. I mean, the next thing is kids, of course, too. I mean, if you can work on the next generation to keep them from developing the bad habits that older people already have, then that's how you really change the future. Seems to me that that's the most important bit. Yeah. Because, and I have kids, you know, the, when you see some of the advertising out there, to shield them from that yeah. is vital yeah. because it's so pernicious. We adults can make our own decision. These little ones can't. Yeah. Uh, what sort of weight do you put on really looking after those young tender minds and keeping them away from oh. all that as much as possible? Keeping them away from it, but also offering them an alternative. Right. In, in this country and the rest of the world too, they're starting to see school gardens come back. Yeah. Not to make food to feed the kids during lunchtime, but to show them what a garden looks right, like right, and to right. get them excited about a radish so they can go home to their parents and say, you'll never believe what I just saw at school, this thing called a radish, can we buy that the next time we go shopping, right? Sort of teaching them the value of real food, I think in and of itself can be strong enough to kind of push back against the advertising that'll continue to bombard them for the junk stuff. Michael Moss, thank you very much for your time. Oh, my pleasure, thank you.